How many of you have in your organization strategies focused on delivering value to your stakeholders, to your customers, to your clients, to your patients? Most of you aren't putting strategies in place that say, we want to deliver a lot of stuff cheaply. Your strategies are we want to be value added if you're in healthcare. The payers, the third party payers, will only pay for value. They won't pay you for performance, whether you admitted and did surgery. They pay you for value, whether your surgery worked and you didn't have to readmit a patient. In fact, depending on the diagnosis, readmitting a patient within a certain amount of time is actually not reimbursable because it wasn't valuable. So all of our organizations are wanting to deliver value. Therefore, to align with our organizations, we would need each of our employees to deliver value. Our hard assets, we want return on investment. Our talent assets, we want value. The value that employees deliver adds up to the value the customer experiences. And yet, we still measure performance. Performance has very little correlation to value. I have gone into major organizations and I've looked at their performance ratings and I've looked at their value defined by 10 key items, not all of which are financial. Things like patient and customer satisfaction, market share, longevity, sustainability, um, attractiveness to hire. Looked at the value proposition. And what I found out is those folks that had bell-shaped curves in their performance were closely aligned with value, but not completely. Most of you, your performance measures have no alignment with value. Here's what's crazy about that. You've got high performers that you are telling them they're a five and they're unfit for human consumption. You've got team members, project managers, who you'd say are top performers and they've never delivered a project on time or on budget, ever. And we give them a five. I've sat in the C-suite when you've come in and said, we need more money for bonuses and raises because our people have done so well. We have so many top performers. When our financials said we had the worst year ever. And when I said, what's up? You go, well, the economy's down. It's not really, they worked hard, the economy's down. And I said, I'm not going to pay somebody who hasn't figured out how to achieve value in a down economy. It's not about effort. See, measuring performance is like measuring somebody's cholesterol level to see if they have diabetes. It's no longer a relative metric. So when we looked at this and we said, what makes up value? If you look at the value of a consumable item, value is, does it do what it says it's going to do, right? Does it even perform? It's like pass fail. Is it sustainable? Will it perform well into the future? And in order to know what's value, we have to look at, at what cost, what total cost, even cost of ownership. And we need to do that with our employees as well. Now, when you look at employee value, this is the value of their work, not them as a human being. Everyone has value as a human being. I'm just asking you to make sure you're clear on the value of their work. So if you want to really understand your value and the value of the people you work with, if you want to know what boosts your value and kills your chances, let's run through this formula. First of all, you look at your performance on a scale of one to five. One, you're on performance plan, it's low. Three, you are consistently delivering what the organization requires. Now that's a twist. So you look at strategy and what you deliver cascades down. See, what the organization requires is that you increase sales 10% even in a down economy. It doesn't give you extra bonus points for circumstances. So a three is somebody who delivers what the organization requires, not what's easy, not what's doable, not what they like, not what's always in their strengths wheelhouse, but what the organization requires. A five is somebody who's breaking the curve. And these numbers aren't ego numbers. How I know that you're accurately rating is that an individual's rating over a course of five years should change consistently by a point. I've been a five in my life. Curve breaker, they rewarded me. Then they came and studied me. They made that the new standardized process. And just to get a three, those were the results you produced. 
I've been a two in my life. I had two babies in one year. They were not twins. I was a two, because I had great leaders who were honest with me. My goal became get to work with no puke on my shirt, and their goals were, were a little different, right? Now, on a scale of one to five, if I had to rate myself, I would give myself and my performance a three. And some of you are so gracious, you're like, Sai, you're better than that, you're awesome. I go, thank you, and you're del delusional. Because see, my competition isn't speakers you've seen before. My competition is thought leaders worldwide. At the National Sherm, I can apply for a keynote, but if Hillary Clinton applies, guess what I get? Breakout session. See, she's a five, and I'm a three. Oprah five, Sai three. When my new book came out, it hit the New York Times bestseller list. I started thinking, I'm at least a four. And then my staff calibrated with me. They said, Sai, come here. They go, congratulations on hitting the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. That's great stuff. Um, and, and let's be very clear. You've been in the business 20 years. The fact that you wrote a book that's called Right on Target, and the fact that it was a bestseller is fairly expected, that if you've been in the market this long and what you write should actually be good. And then they said, you're not a four side. Daniel Pink, he has 17 bestsellers. You have one. Daniel's four, you're one. And I go, oh, I got it again. See, a lot of us go, but I was a four point student. And I go, good job in college. <laughs> it's not the same. But I work really hard. Si, I do more than my fair share. I go, thank you. Seriously, Si, I do more than my fair share. I go, seriously, thank you. Performance should be rating the work, not the person. Now let's look at potential. Potential is whether you have any odds of performing far into the future. Potential is how ready you are for what's next. Are you keeping up with the times faster than your market's changing? Are you staying relevant? See, a lot of people, we've led them to believe that change is hard. How many of you have change management uh, programs that you give people time to grieve? Yeah. And see, I think that makes sense. If you lose your partner, your spouse, a child, your long, you know, loved pet, you probably do need time to grieve. But your software? Really? See, what I tell people is get fluent but not attached. I'm going to be back for it. Here's your software. Don't fall in love. I'm getting it in probably two years. I just want you fluent. Are you ready for what's next? See, people think change is hard, but you know what? Change is only hard for the unready. In fact, I'll be so controversial as to rename unemployment a measure of unready. If you're unemployed for a year or more, that's about unreadiness because all of us have jobs we're dying to fill. We just can't find candidates successful. Does that make sense? If I'm ready for change, I just move into it freely. So let's talk potential. A one in potential on a scale of one to five, a one is low potential. Not could they do more, not like your talent assessments. It's, it's how zealous they are for learning. Like a one, when you go to the museum of training tomorrow, they go, do I have to? Is it mandatory? What will happen if I don't go? Actually, one guy say, I know y'all are moving to Outlook, but can't we just do courier from me? I'm only going to be here like three more years. <laughs> Anybody have a few of those folks? Yeah, a three in potential is somebody keeping up with the times, somebody who is continuing their education, they're involved in their industry, they're involved in professional organizations, they're personally evolving themselves, health and, and spirit and mind. They love to teach. They are great learners. They're multi-generational, they're multicultural. They are citizens of the universe and they're responsible citizens of the universe. A five is genius level stuff, people inventing the future. I know a guy at National Institute of Health, he's growing livers in Petri dishes. He's a five. He's figured out how to grow livers in Petri dishes. He says that in 20 years, you'll be able to go into a Walmart and pick up a case of beer and a liver. I'm so impressed with this man. So if I had to rate myself, I'd give myself a three. I work hard to keep up with the times. Now, a lot of you might be thinking you're a four or a five, and that could be true. Could be true. 
Every once in a while, when I think I'm all that in a bag of chips, I usually find myself instantly humbled. I went to Mumbai last year, and they presented me the World Thought Leader HR Congress Award, not the regional, the world. And they gave me a trophy. I had to buy a suitcase to bring my trophy home. This is before I knew everyone who goes to India gets a trophy. But (laughs) nonetheless, I'm pretty proud. And I come back through the US, and I have about a two-hour layover, which is perfect, because the series, the World Series is on first night. I'm so excited. I go in to uh, watch the series into a bar, and I go in, and I'm like, hey, can you turn the game to the series? And the bartender says, "Uh, no, I can't. See, someone requested the game that's on. It was the 1970 World Cup soccer game, first one in color. I've seen it 14 times. It's awesome. Pele, head bumps, it's amazing. But it's not what I want to watch the night of the World Series. And she said, well, somebody requested that, and we only have one TV, so if someone requests a game, another person can't trump their request, otherwise we'd have conflict breaking out in here. I understand, I looked around, I thought, easily solved, no one else is in the bar. So certainly you could change it, because the guy who asked for that maybe is on a flight to Buenos Aires or Sao Paulo or something. She wouldn't change it, so I'm mad, I'm scooping up my stuff and heading out. Then walks this young guy, he's probably about 25, he goes, hey, is that a new iPhone? He saw my new iPhone, I go, "Uh, yeah, I'm a thought leader, high potential, trophy in my suitcase, it's a new iPhone, I keep up. And he goes, oh, that's nice. And he goes, how come the game's not on? And I go, because the bartender's a nut job, and she won't turn the TV, and she's like, you know, totally rule following, probably on a performance plan, because she's rigid about this thing. And he goes, yeah, but why isn't the series on? I'm like, I told you, the bartender, I'm blaming my circumstances. He looks at me, and he goes, um, but that's a new iPhone. I go, yes, I'm a thought leader. And he goes, well, can I see your iPhone? I said, sure. And he takes a look at my iPhone, and he downloads an application for a universal remote control, (laughs) and and flips the channel. (laughs) Yeah, I'm a three. (laughs) He's a four. (laughs) He looks at me, he goes, "Um, and you're buying the beer. I go, seriously, yes, right? (laughs) Now, if you're over 40, subtract one off your potential score and change all your compensation systems. The people who should be paid the most are the smartest ones, and they happen to be between the ages of 20 and 35. And the rest of us should just ask for their mercy that we might hang around a few years longer, (laughs) right? So potential, I'm a three, that makes me a six. That's high value stuff, folks. I'm a six. But before I know my whole value, I know I perform today, and I know that I'm likely to have my performance be sustainable because I'm keeping up with the times. But most of us stop there with our math, and we go home feeling taken advantage of. I give six, I don't get paid six, no one appreciates me, I don't add value. It's because we're doing bad math. Here's the best math, is instead of just stopping there, if you want to know your value, you have to know the total cost of you. The total cost of you, in addition to your salary and benefits, we have titled this emotional expensiveness. The hassle factor, the drama quotient, the drama quotient, the freak out factor. See, what's the total cost of you? Because there's two different types of value. Let's say I have two average performers. They get the same performance rating. I go to one, and they said, I need you to work in a different branch today. We had somebody call in sick, and they're woefully understaffed, and you might need to stay there a week or two, depending on um, what, how this thing turns out. Average performer number one goes, oh my gosh, thanks for the opportunity. I'm honored that you would think of me. I tend to be really good at learning on the fly. This will give me some practice. It'll be cool. I'm cross-trained. Learn another position the way I see it. That's job security, and it's super cool because it's closer to my house. So just let me know what you need. And then when they're driving there and we call them up, we go, we were mistaken. We meant branch C. They go, hey, that happens. Um, I'll just uh, turn my car around, and I'll be there in about five minutes. And we have performer number two. Um, say I need you over to cover in this branch. We got somebody out sick. 
Why are you asking me? Who else have you asked? Do you have an Excel spreadsheet to show me that you have fairly distributed the work? Um, will I get paid extra? Are you reimbursing my gas? Because I know I'm responsible to get here, but I'm not responsible to get to there. And I'm just wondering, I'll work over there, but Bob and I, we have issues. That's why he got moved over there. And so I'll work there, but I won't talk to Bob. Which one's more valuable? <laughs> and they have the same performance rating. The emotional expensiveness is an inverted scale. It's on a scale from one to five, but inverted, a one low maintenance. Zeros, you've heard of these people. Gandhi, Buddha, Muhammad, Jesus, Mother Teresa, okay? These are people who walk in and the drama, just the angels sing and the drama goes away. I call them my DDs. See, Lady Gaga has her monsters and I got my DDs, my drama diffusers. They're the ones that are scoring at zero or one. They're the people who call people to greatness. And then there's threes. This is the average typical employee who hasn't got the memo. They still think that they have a God-given right to have a meltdown now and then. These are the employees that about once a month come in, they go, oh my gosh, I just have to talk. I'm surrounded by idiots. I don't get paid enough. No one communicates around here. Things are unfair. I do everything. Yeah, this is so prevalent and so sanctioned in your organizations that y'all have whole departments for it. I mean, think about it, right? People come in, they threaten to jump. They go, I'm jumping, going off the ledge. And we have to call the HR SWAT team and come in and give them a jeans day and <laughs> pen and some fish philosophy. Yeah, these are people who actually believe there's no price to drama when there is an enormous price to drama, enormous. I had an employee come to me one day and uh, she said the new girl she's stealing from the organization. I go, wow, good to know, keeps me neutral. I resist the urge to manage and go investigate, I lead instead. I go, tell me more. And she goes, well, I didn't like her when you hired her, so I've been watching her. And she comes in late, and then she writes on her time system that she's in on time. And I called her the first day, and then I watched her for a couple of days, and then I had to go to a conference, so I got my two buddies to do a stakeout and watch her. And here's an Excel spreadsheet. She's stolen about $114 from the company. I go, wow, good to know. And I said, while we're doing math, let's look at your crime. We added up all the time she spent judging and all the time she spent staking out and all the time she spent on the Excel spreadsheet, which was unlicensed for her desktop. <laughs> and I added up the time I didn't even add up the Excel violation and her, this was almost $1,000. And I said, what, which crime's bigger? And leaders, HR, which crimes are we worried about? Which one's sucking our organization's dry of value, righteousness, drama, judgment? That's what's sucking our organizations. Now, I went to the person who may have no, lied on their timesheet, and I said that a colleague has uh, shared a concern that you may not be operating within integrity. We don't want any employee to ever feel that that's the choice they have to make because we want integrity to be the first choice always. And I asked her about it. And she told me her mom was on hospice and that she was the second nursing visit of the day and she often didn't know and she didn't want to tell me she wouldn't get the job. So I gave her a written warning for lying. I gave her flexible work time and I went out to my team and I said, Sarah's getting flexible work time. I hope you all support it. Now imagine the gossip that would go around in your organizations. But see, my people knew the rules. There are three lanes. Lane one's your business. Lane two is other people's business. Lane three is reality. The only time you get stressed is if you get out of your lane. If you want stress, start comparing. Do a little scorekeeping. I'm not making you unhappy. You're making yourself unhappy. I'm hard on you. What would make you think that I would let somebody else buy with stuff? I'm awesome at coaching. Does that make sense to you guys? Fives are folks that are unfit for human consumption. They have somebody believing they're the only ones who know how to do that job. And um, that's sure because they won't transfer knowledge. And even though they're unfit for human consumption, we keep them. They add zero value because even though they're an expert, no one will call them. You call Ed. I'm not calling Ed. I called Ed last time. You call Ed. Let's look it up on Google. 
These are people that when they call in sick, attendance goes up. <laughs> people call in, they go, I have a headache. Dude, take Tylenol, come in. Do not waste the PTO, Ed's gone. <laughs> don't get opportunities like this. Usually his wife won't let him stay home because she hates him. Now, on a scale of one to five, I would tell you I'm about a two. I teach this stuff and I screw it up, but only daily. Now, six minus two is four, ton of value, except here's what we found out, that this emotional expensiveness has a multiplier effect. Kills your brand, kills your teams, kills your culture, kills your climate. I can't be emotionally expensive all by myself. It multiplies. My two becomes a six because the multiplier is a three. When we did the regression analysis, it's a three multiplier. Now, think about that. Where do we spend the most time coaching? Performance. Few top potential, high potentials, we coach them a little bit. But what we're not coaching is emotional expensiveness, and we've made up stories about why we can't. Well, it's not measurable. Yes, it is. A scale of one to 10, how much of a hassle are you? Let me ask others. <laughs> well, they're about a nine. Okay, close enough. We don't have to argue whether you're a six or a 10. A nine and hassle factor is a problem. We need to really look at this because my two, which seems low drama, we don't have the luxury anymore. Our resources are cut to the bone and this is where we as leaders and employees can step up and deliver value. Because every point I lose in emotional expensiveness, I gain three in value. So my two becomes a six, folks, and here is my total value, it's zero. And I'm so proud of this. It doesn't mean I don't add value. It means my ego's in check. See, at the end of today, we will be even. I'll have given you great value, you'll have paid me exactly what I asked for, and I will head out the door and we'll do knuckles. I'll go, you rock, you'll go, no say, you rock. I'll go, see you next time. He'll go, see you next time. And I'll go, I'm going home to my kids. Me too. Wouldn't it be great to go home from work with energy left over for your family? Even? See, it's not our work that is killing us. It's not our work that is stressing us. It's the stories we make up about our work. It's our bad math. It is so exciting because you can go home suffering or with joy Tonight, your choice. And part of the way to get there is just to do better math. See, this revolution is not about making better circumstances for our people. It's about bulletproofing our people and giving them the freedom they've had all along.